All right, welcome back. We're going to start looking at the supply and demand model today as we uh, move forward with microeconomics. You're going to find the information we talk about today in Chapter 3, titled Supply and Demand, pages 62 to 71. And there you're going to find information about uh, the difference between a movement along the demand curve and a shift in the demand curve, the things that might cause the demand curve to shift. Um, and you'll be able to, hopefully by the end of all of this, be able to describe the determinants of demand and predict changes in the demand curve given different scenarios in the, in the market. But before we get too far into it, um, we want to talk briefly about what is a market. A market is pretty simple. In a mic macro, blah, microeconomic world, markets are a, uh, are a combination of consumers and producers who are getting together to exchange goods and services for some form of payment and we're going to look at the most basic one first it's called the competitive market and there are a number of different market structures that we'll discuss in micro but the competitive market is the is the most simple and easiest to understand within a, a competitive market there are basically five different um, elements to the model we have a demand curve and the demand curve is downward sloping which tells us that as uh, prices drop we'll want more of the good and as prices go up will want less of the good. And there's also a supply curve, and the supply curve is upward sloping, which tells us that those who are producing goods and services are willing to produce more if they can get a higher price. We also know that there's this thing called equilibrium, which we've talked about with macro. And the equilibrium is simply the, the place in which the supply and demand intersect and that would be our market price and our market quantity that's where the amount supplied is equal to the amount demanded and that's where uh, markets tend to head toward is equilibrium now equilibrium will change and so we'll we need to recognize that there are uh, demand and supply factors that cause those two curves to shift and we'll talk more about them and that also also ultimately leads to a change in equilibrium and so we will begin as we begin to, uh, begin looking at this model begin to understand better what causes prices and quantities to change um, over time but the first thing we want to look at is the demand curve and that's pages 62 to 71 now the demand curve um, helps us kind of calculate how much of some good people want. So we could say, how could we calculate the amount of coffee demanded in a given year? Well, we could ask people. And we could create what's known as a demand schedule that tells us how much uh, coffee is demanded for people by people at given prices. So we could look and we could say, if the price of coffee were $8 a pound, then people would want 3 pounds. And if it dropped to 7, then may maybe people want 5 pounds. And if the price were $3 a pound, then maybe we want 16 pounds and so forth. And so we have this demand curve beginning to form and take shape. And that demand curve is always going to be downward sloping. And it's known as the cause of it is because of what's known as the law of demand. That as prices rise, the quantity demanded drops. And it's, um, it's called a law because that's reality. It, it is what it is. That if prices are higher, people want less of every, um, of every good. And so a downward sloping demand curve is created. We talk about two things. One is called a change in quantity demanded, and the other is a shift in demand. So we'll talk about quantity of uh, change in quantity demanded first. A change in the quantity demanded is caused by a change in price. If the price goes up, I want less. My demand schedule, however, doesn't change. So I'm just moving along my demand curve. Um, and so this is what we call a movement that is different from a shift in demand in which the amount of goods that I demand changes at a, at a given price. And that would be a, a movement, or a shift, pardon me. So in a movement, though, we're talking about a change in price. And in this case, the price dropped from $1.50, then we move from point A to point B. Um, if the price dropped from $1.50 to $1, then I would demand not 8.1 billion pounds of coffee, but now 10 billion. So that's a movement along. There are times in in which, though, my demand schedule for coffee will change and shift from A to C. And there are a number of reasons why that happens, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is called a change in demand, because now I want more at $1.50 than I wanted before. So 
Movement along the curve is caused by a change in price. A movement or a shift in the curve is caused by some other factor. Those other factors are called the determinants of demand. And we can use a mnemonic called MERIT to help us understand what causes a shift in the demand curve. The M in MERIT is the market size or the number of consumers, the expectations of consumers, the related prices or prices of related goods, income, and our tastes and preferences. All of those will impact uh, our demand schedule and cause it to shift if there is a change in any one of those factors. So when we talk about shifts in demand, we're talking about uh, a movement of the curve itself so that um, if it increases demand, it's going to shift to the right, and if there's a decrease in demand, it shifts to the left. So in this case, there's an increase in demand, it shifts to the right, and then D3 is a decrease in demand, shifting to the left. When there's an increase in demand, again, what that means is I want more of any good at a given price. If the price were $10 and I wanted 10 units before, now I want 20 units at $10, there has been an increase in demand. So let's look at the demand determinants in a little more detail. When it comes to market size, what we're talking about here is the amount of goods demanded at a given price. That's a shift in demand. Um, and we know that if there are more buyers, there is a shift in demand. Fewer buyers leads to a, a left shift in demand. And if you want to know why, let's think about um, the cost of prescription drugs as population gets older. As there are more and more people getting older, there's a bigger market for prescription drugs. And, um, and that is going to change our demand schedule as there are more and more people looking for and seeking this uh, limited good known as prescription drugs. And if you were to graph it out, you could see um, in, the, in the coffee beans example, if there was one person only and this was Darla and she was the only person in our market, then this is her demand schedule. But if we add Dino to the demand schedule um, and, and all of the um, quantities he demands at different prices, and we have this new market demand curve where we have incorporated both of them, so that if the price is $2, then Darla wants 20 pounds, Dina wants 10, so in this new market with an additional person added to it, at $2, 30 pounds of coffee is now demanded. And then if the price were $1, Darla wanted 30, Dino wanted 20, so in this new expanded market, at $1 a pound, we have a demand of $50 are 50 pounds of coffee. So with more people, there is a shift in demand. Expectations. If we expect future prices or product availability or income or something to change, that will change our willingness to pay. So if you expected gas uh, prices to drop next week, odds are pretty good. You would not buy gas this week. You'd wait till next week. As a result, that's going to cause a shift in demand. Or if the iPhone 5 is going to be released um, in the next couple of months, then you know, you're know you not going to want as many iPhone 4s as you did before because you now have this different product that you can purchase. The price of related goods is also something that comes into play. Uh, the, the effect of related prices on demand depends on, on whether the good is either known as a substitute um, or a complement. And in the case of a substitute, what we're talking about is that if the price of one good goes up, then the demand for another good, um, the substitute would go up. So if the price of coffee goes up, then I'm going to shift my demand to tea. So if coffee is more expensive, then I'm going to want more tea. That's a substitute. If there's a complement, um, those are goods that go together, uh, like peanut butter and jelly, then if the price of one good goes up, then my demand for the other goes down because it's more expensive now to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm, so when the price of peanut butter goes up, I'm going to make fewer sandwiches, which means I need, I need less jelly. And so when we see the price rise and demand fall for another good, that's a complement. Income is another factor in, in shifting demand. Um, in most cases, at least in terms of what are known as normal goods, in most cases, if my income goes up, I want more of, uh, of a good. That would be a normal good. But there are some goods known as inferior goods that are different. In those cases, when my income um, rises, then my demand for those goods goes down. And when my income goes down, my demand for those goods goes up. 
And an example for that would be bus versus plane tickets. Clearly, a, a plane is considered a normal good. We would much rather travel by plane than bus. And if my income rises, I'm going to buy more plane tickets. But if my income were to drop, then um, I would choose buses over planes in order to be economical. Or put a different way, if my income rises, I'm going to purchase fewer bus trips because I now have enough money to be able to pay for a plane trip, which is more preferable. So in those cases in which a rise in income leads to a decrease in demand, we're talking about inferior goods. Most of the time, though, we're talking about normal goods where a rise in income will lead to an increase in demand. And finally, our tastes. Um, if there's a favorable change towards a product, they're now more um, more sought after for whatever reason, then we see an increase in demand. If there's an unfavorable change, we'll see a decrease in demand. And we can see this in all, a variety of different goods, especially goods with uh, that may may have a fad. Um, so there was um, a huge shift in silly bands. At one point, nobody had bought them. They, they had no real market. Suddenly, they become very popular with kids. And uh, the demand for silly bands shoots through the roof and, and shifts to the right significantly, um, that would be a change in taste. Or if, if uh, the Redskins win the Super Bowl, that would certainly increase demand for their merchandise because as a winner, uh, people would want to be associated with that team and, um, and therefore they'd want to buy more stuff. And so our tastes will also impact our demand schedule, shifting it either to the right or left depending on, on whether it's a positive change or a negative change. And when you come into class next time, we'll talk some more about um, these different de determinants of demand, particularly looking at complements, substitutes, inferior normal goods. And uh, we'll get some more practice at looking at what's going to cause shifts in our demand curve. And I'll be happy to an answer any questions that you have then. So look forward to seeing you. Bye.